Thanks, Pauline. All right, well, thank you very much for being here. I've just come to tell you my story in the hope it inspires you in some ways and you don't make the same mistakes I did. In a nutshell, I went to this school, um, so it's a special privilege for me to be here today. Ended up going to Sixth Form College up by Pexhill, did A-levels, maths, physics and economics. Went off to Liverpool Uni and did business studies. And when I graduated, England was in a recession. But I went to America, had two aunts living out there, made a million in the stock market. The money went to my head. I started throwing rave parties with it. Had people bringing ecstasy in, so I was knowingly breaking the law. SWAT team smashed my door down, and I end up in this jail that's got the highest rate of death in America, where not only are the gang members murdering the prisoners, even the guards are murdering the prisoners. Now, it's going to be a very hard-hitting talk. There's going to be some graphic images. If anyone's squeamish, I'll warn you before they come up. There might be a little time at the end for questions and answers. If there's not, my card's gone around the room, and I will respond to any questions that are sent to me by email, Facebook, or Twitter. Now, it's going to start to get gruesome in about five minutes. I'm just going to go back to my school years. Here's what I looked like when I was about 13, 14 at this school. And I had a full head of the Wham style her. Huh? That's me on the left. At this age, I chose economics. And only about six of us here did economics. And the teacher, Mr. Dillon, really took me under his wing. He had me reading the Financial Times, following the stock market. At 16, I borrowed 50 quid off my nan, doubled it in BT shares. So I was hooked on the stock market at this very young age. I'm telling all my mates back then, I'm going to go to America, make a million in the stock market and fly all you guys over. You know, that was my dream. Now, I went on to um, Liverpool Uni, did business studies. But when I graduated, England was in a recession. It was hard to get a job. So I had these two aunts living in Phoenix. They were like, just jump on a plane and come out here, get a job really easy with English accent. So that's what I did. I didn't have any money. I just went there with my student credit cards. And my first two years, because the job was commission only, I was basically living off cheese on toast and bananas, just wondering if I was ever going to make it. But five years in, pursuing my dream, working these long hours, I'm the top guy in the office, making over half a million a year, got my own staff, secretary, call callers. I'm only in my 20s and I've got enough money to retire. I put that money into technology shares, and they all shot up. And that was how I became a millionaire. But I was also throwing raves. Now this goes back to when I was at uni. The acid house scene had started in Manchester. It was news headlines every weekend. Young people breaking into warehouses, breaking into airplane hangars, wearing all this crazy coloured clothing, dancing to what was a new style of music back then, and taking this drug called ecstasy. So I was seeing this on the news and wondering what it was all about. I had a mate out of Manchester, he says, come and check this club out. I went to the club, I tried ecstasy, tried speed, kept doing drugs and not thinking of the consequences. When I got to Arizona, the rave scene was very small. I start throwing house parties for dozens of people at first. I'm showing off because I've got the most money, buying everybody drugs, thinking I'm Mr. Cool Guy and it's never going to catch up with me. And I'm getting as addicted to the lifestyle and the attention I'm getting from throwing these parties as I am getting addicted to the club drugs. And it just got bigger and bigger and bigger. And so at the peak of it, I'm in a million dollar house on the side of a mountain in a gated, guarded community. Got my own swimming pool, jacuzzi. Got my own rave, clothing, music store. I think I've got it made, but I've been breaking the law for so long and getting away with it. I'm also thinking that I'm above the law and it's never ever going to catch up with me. But it always does, sooner or later. On May 16, 2002, there was a knock on my door. Tempe Police Department, we have a warrant. Open the door. I'm on the computer, I jump up, I look out the peephole and it's blacked out. Run to the bedroom to get my girlfriend. I'm like, what should we do, what should we do? I think we better let them in. We get halfway to the, through the living room. Boom! Door just flies off its hinges. Hands above your heads, don't move, get on the ground now. So they crush us, handcuff us, I'm yanked up, and I'm charged with talking about illegal drugs on the phone. Over 100 people are arrested with me in SWAT team Dawn Raid. Half of them are girls. Anyone who spoke about drugs on the phone was arrested because the cops had been recording all of our conversations. 
All of my money was seized and I never got any of it back. My bail was set at three quarters of a million cash only. So there's no way I was getting out of this jail. I've got a video on my YouTube channel right now that's got about half a million hits. It's the guard's screen in his control tower in the jail I was at. He's supposed to be watching this and stopping any trouble as it happens. Only wasn't watching it closely on this particular day. It's a video of an Urian brother prison gang member murdering another inmate who's refused to beat someone up for the gang. Method he uses to kill him, for almost 10 minutes, he just smashes this guy's head over and over and over into the concrete. 10 minutes in, the guard still haven't responded. And you can see him just stomping on the back of the guy's head and neck, blood just going everywhere. 20 minutes in, the guard still haven't responded. So he picks the dead body up, brings it out, right in front of the camera, like he's trying to show it off. He tries to throw it off a balcony, it gets stuck on a railing, and he just starts kicking it over and over and over again. Only then do the guards notice what's going on and put this guy down. This is how much control the gangs have got in this place over the prisoners versus the guards. Now, because I had female co-defendants, I knew what was going on the women's side as well. One woman was pregnant, she sat on the toilet, and she had a miscarriage, and she collapsed and passed out on the floor. The guards come in, revived her with smelling salts, ordered her to fish the dead baby out of the toilet, and didn't give her any medical treatment whatsoever. And the other women in there were pregnant, they actually shackle them down to a bunk, and they're chained down in that position while they're giving birth. Now here's what the jail cell looks like, about the size of a bus stop shelter, originally designed for one person. See, there's one bunk at the back. Over the years, they put three bunks in there, one on top of the other, so it's way overcrowded. The toilet is that stainless steel seatless thing at the front. So when you go on the toilet, you have the guys you're living with on one side, guys in the day room on the other side. It's embarrassing going on the toilet with people walking around you, but it's just something that you've got to get used to. Now, Phoenix is the hottest of the big cities out there. It gets up to almost 50 degrees, and it's hot all year round. It's way too hot to be wearing the black and white remand jail outfits. So to try and stay a little bit cooler, everyone's going around their underwear, which are these pink boxers. Even so, we're sweating day after day. And what starts to happen is we get these skin infections and bed sores that itch and bleed, especially on our behinds. The problem is when you go to scratch yourself, when you're sweating constantly like that, the outer layers of your skin start to turn soggy. So you get this itchiness and you scratch yourself and clumps of your own skin detach under your nails. At night you're just tossing and turning in the pool of your own sweat and the itchiness is keeping you awake. Now it's completely gang controlled. Whites, blacks, Mexicans, Mexican-Americans are the four major gangs. Because I'm white, as soon as I walked in, the Aryan Brotherhood prison gang come up to me and first thing they do is ask you what your charges are. So whatever race you are, a gang is going to come up and do this. There's no way around it. And you can't lie about your charges because it's on a little printout from the jail. Some charges are K-O-S by the gang, which means kill on sight, such as paedophile stuff. Other charges are S-O-S, which means smash on sight, such as drive-by shootings because women and kids sometimes get hit. Anyone who's got a sex offence or a crime against a woman or a child, as soon as they come in the jail, the gang's going to try and murder them or at the very least smash them. It's called convict justice. Once you get through that interrogation, then you have to go to the meeting and meet the head of the race, who explains all the rules you must follow or else the whole gang will smash you. If someone calls you a punk, a bitch or hits you, you must fight them on the spot or else the whole gang will smash you. You must take showers, or else they'll smash you having bad hygiene. Can't go make your friends with the guards, or else they'll smash you for snitching. Can't go sit at the tables with the other races, or else they'll smash you for that. Everything you take for granted about your safety in society is reversed in jail. They're constantly looking for people to beat up, because that's how they make their reputations and earn their tattoos. It's called putting work in to earn your political ink. 
And the more serious the act of violence, higher up in the gang are the tattoos that they earn. Under every head of the race, a guy's called torpedoes. They'll go in and smash someone, no questions asked, just so they can earn their tattoos, which look like this. The guy on the right, he was getting escorted to medical one day, snatched the guard's gun, shot him dead, and escaped. He didn't get very far, though. He was actually picked up at a local McDonald's. Smart criminal. This guy on the left, that's the full Aryan Brotherhood membership tattoo, Warbird. To earn that tattoo, to be a full member of the gang, you have to murder someone in the jail for them. Now, it was half Hispanic where I was at, and here's what their tattoos look like. Does anyone know what the teardrop tattoos mean? Each solid teardrop is one person that he's murdered for his gang. Preferred method to kill you is with a shank. They strip metal from all over the place and you hear them at night sharpening them into knives. All those in the background are homemade knives that have been confiscated by the guards. Now I'm about to show you some graphic images of young people who've been attacked in the jail by gang members. Why on earth would I want to do that? Because you see all these movies and music videos that make the drugs, crime, gangster lifestyles look cool, but they don't show what happens to the young people when they get busted. The old cons are checking them out when they walk through the door as potential to rape, rob, and do a range of bad things to. So I'm showing you the other side of it, so you've got more information to make your own decisions. Before I go there, I'm going to backtrack. This photo at the bottom, it's a PR photo put out by the jail. It portrays the holiday camp atmosphere you hear jails described as in the news. Fresh-faced youngsters going in, her nicely groomed, stripes all clean. Looks like they're going to have a good old time playing video games and watching TV. You hear this in the news all the time. Please don't fall for it. What's happening in the media right now is they're softening the UK public up for US-style justice. That's what our politicians are introducing to England right now. It's not the reality of what an adult prison is like for a young person. Reality is coming up in these pictures now. And like I mentioned earlier, if you are squeamish, don't look now. I'm going to go through them pretty quickly. <clears throat> He was murdered during a race riot, stabbed in the head, shank across the face, the gang cut him so deep he could stick his tongue out through his cheek. So I'm in this medium security remand jail my first year. You know, my, my parents aren't rich people, but they remortgage their house and come up with money for a lawyer. He's like, look, Sean, we can get you out of the jail. We can go court, have a bail hearing, get your bail reduced, and you can fight your case outside the jail. So I'm getting all excited. Yeah, getting out of the jail. My girlfriend's excited. All my local family show up in court. Uncle, ex-police officer, speaks on my behalf and offers to supervise me. Seems to have gone really well. Except, prosecutor's trying to make her name off the back of my case. She sabotages the hearing. The judge, when he makes his ruling, he doubles my bail to 1.5 million cash only. When your bail goes over a mil, you're automatically reclassified from medium security to maximum security. I thought these guys were hardcore over here. I was about to get thrown into where it was nearly all murderers. So the night I got moved, it was about two in the morning when I walk into the cell. There's some light slanting in from the day room, but it's dark inside. First thing I notice is it's a two-man cell. I think, oh, that's an improvement, but I'm wondering why my cellmate is asleep on the top bunk. Because where I come from, people fight over the bottom bunk. So I'm thinking something's not quite right. So I walk in some more. And I start to sense movement on the walls and the ceiling. I think my eyes are playing tricks on me. So I put my face right up to one of the walls to see what's going on. And it's covered in these guys, cockroaches. Got used to the violence by now. 
trying to get to sleep with these crawling on me gave me nervous breakdown. I had to get put on medication to get to sleep. Eight at night is lockdown. Ten is lights out. It's like the cockroaches know just when the lights are about to go out. They start lining up in the cracks in the walls, doing this little movement with the antennae sticking out, like an army waiting to invade. As soon as the lights go out, they just flood the room. Now you've got a choice. You can wrap a sheet around you so you look like the mummy and leave a breathing hole and it does keep them off you, but it traps the heat to your body. And like I mentioned earlier, you've got these bleeding and itching, skin infections and bed sores. It aggravates that condition so you can't sleep. So you end up just throwing the sheet off and letting them crawl on you. Now they don't bite. They start out tickling your feet, your limbs, the palms of your hands. They try to get in your ears to eat your earwax. It's like honey to them. Is anyone in here asthmatic? Any brave asthmatics? All right, well, check this story out. I've got a neighbor in maximum security who was asthmatic. He wakes up one morning, out of breath, grabs his inhaler, takes a blast, shoots a cockroach inside himself, says he can feel it moving around. He throws up his stomach contents trying to get rid of it and somehow it's stuck in there and it won't come out. Even in the daytime there were so many, the prisoners were doing cockroach races on the tables in the day room, gambling on the winner. And first thing in the morning you see the fellas come out of their cells with plastic containers, they put peanut butter in to trap them during the night. And they'd empty all the dead ones into the trash can under the stairs. It didn't matter how many we killed. They own the building. Now, I'm just going to put some of this in the context of the UK prison system, because I don't want you leaving here today thinking this stuff only happens in America. I've got a young person who was writing to me out of a London prison. He was high on ecstasy and weed, and he smashed his vehicle. And his best mate died in the accident, so he ended up doing time for that. And here's what he wrote to me from the London prison about the food. The food in here is just rank. It's no good if you're trying to stay healthy. Stews look like vomit. Curries are bowls of coloured water with disturbing meat. And chips are like rubber. I mean, proper rubber. They are not edible. Also, in the UK, it's not racial gangs like it is in America. Although it is starting in London with the Blood and Crip gangs. Everything's just following the American style. Five to ten years behind. Traditionally in England, it's gangs that are competing to control the drugs because it's big business. And one of the punishments they have in the UK prison system is they boil up sugar, bleach and water, throw it on your face and the sugar makes it stick to your skin and it scars you for life. Now there was another threat from the insect world in Arizona that also came out during the night that did bite. Any of you guys don't like spiders? You wouldn't even see it. It's called the brown recluse. It would come out at night looking for food. And you would roll around in your sleep and touch it. And it would bite you. And you would wake up the next day with a little pinprick. And you might not even think too much about that. In the following days, the pus would start to come out. And your skin would slough away. And it would eat into your flesh and cause what's called a volcano lesion. There were guys in the jail who'd been in shootouts, and as you're about to see, unless you're squeamish, these spiders were putting bigger holes in people's bodies than bullets. I'm only gonna show it for five seconds and I'll count down because it, it makes people ill if it's up there for too long. Five, four, three, two, one. All right, so I'm writing home to my loved ones about these conditions. They're shocked and appalled, but they want to read more. So we have an idea to start a blog. Now, there's no computers or internet or anything like that in the jail, and we can't let the guards find out, because the guards in this jail in Phoenix, Arizona, are murdering the prisoners as well. And it's not the big bad gang members. Brian Crenshaw was classified as a partially blind shoplifter. 
failed to produce his ID. The guards pulverized him, broke his neck, severe internal injuries. He went into a coma and he died over a month later. Scott Norberg was a mentally ill man wandering a the neighborhood. They brought him in. The guards started pulverizing him and electrocuting him with taser guns. Female guard tried to stop it. Stop beating him, his face has turned blue, she yelled. They ignored her and they kept beating him and electrocuting him. The prisoners watching in the holding cells started yelling, why are you still beating him, he's already dead. And even after that, they continued to beat the corpse, turn blue and everything. Both of those cases were caught on CCTV. Family members of the victims of the guards sued the jail in federal court and were awarded millions in compensation. My question for you guys is, do any of you have any idea what the boss of the jail, this guy behind me, Sheriff Joe, did to some of the guards that were found responsible in court for murdering those prisoners? Put your hand up if you think he did something positive. He actually gave them a pay rise and a promotion. He prides himself on being America's toughest sheriff because of all the human rights violations. He's at war with Obama right now and he's saying to Obama, I'm elected in the state of Arizona, I'm going to do whatever I want. As a direct snub to Obama, he announced that his team of investigators had researched Obama's birth certificate, determined it was phony and he's not even eligible to be running the country. All this has been headline news in America. Yeah. Now, fortunately, um, oh, students chained themselves at his building. He had them all arrested and thrown in his jail. They were protesting the human rights. Now, fortunately, the lawyer that my parents paid for got me what's called a plea bargain, and I ended up serving just under six years on a nine and a half year sentence. And I consider myself um, very lucky. You know, my second year in the jail, the prosecutor's saying, Every time I spoke about drugs on the phone, I was looking up five to 10 years. If I go to trial and lose, they could stack my charges up to a maximum 200 year sentence. Now a guard said to me, the world has got no idea what's really going on in here. So with a tiny little pencil sharpened on the door, I started writing everything down. I couldn't put these things in the mail because the guards can open the mail. How am I gonna get them out of the maximum security jail? I recruited my aunt. She would come and visit me on the weekends. She smuggled them out typed them up to my mum and dad in witness. And that's how my blog, John's Jail Journal, started. The BBC ran it, it snowballed, and it went on to attract international media attention to the conditions in the maximum security jail, which was closed down two years later. However, Sheriff Joe runs six different jails. All he did was replace it with a new high-tech house of horrors down the street. If any of you guys want to see how real this stuff is, all these videos that I'm describing to you are on my YouTube channel, Sean Atwood, and a video that we put on the YouTube channel last year was of the guards murdering a prisoner in the new maximum security jail. The guy's a Latino war hero. His name's Marty Atencio. He's mentally ill. He's diagnosed with schizophrenia. He's in a cell. His crime is allegedly kicking a door. He's got his back to the wall in this cell. He's not attacking anyone or causing any trouble. About 15 guards come in. One of them steps forward, grabs him, throws him down. They pile on him like a pack of wolves, beating him, kicking him, punching him, and electrocuting him with taser guns, and he has a heart attack and dies. So if you want to see how real it is, it's on that YouTube channel. Now, I'm just going to read an excerpt from the very first stuff my aunt smuggled out of the jail. And just to give you some background, we've had no running water for three days. So the toilet me and my cellmate sleep next to, it's so full of sewage that the mound has risen above sea level. And my cellmate, he wants to use the toilet. And here's, here's what happens next. My cellmate couldn't hold his in any longer. He pinched his nose and lifted the towel from the toilet. Repulsed by the mound, he said, there's way too much crap to crap on, dog. I'm going to use a bag. So as jail etiquette demands in these situations, I rolled over on my bunk and faced the wall. 
I heard something hit the rim of the seatless toilet and him say, damn, I missed some. When he was done, he put the finished product by the door and the stink doubled. There was no water to clean where the piece had fallen on the toilet, so it remained forming a crustacean on the rim. We were hoping to be allowed out to dispose of the bag until a guard announced, there will be no one coming out for showers and phone calls as we have to get 120 inmates water from an emergency container. The water came back on in stages. In our toilet, its level slowly rose. Oh no, I said, it's about to overflow and we'll be stuck in here with sewage all over the floor. One of us needs to stick his hand in the crap to let the water through, my cellmate said. And you're the closest. <laughs> the brown soup was threatening to spill from the bowl. So I put a sandwich bag on my hand. I can't believe I'm doing this, I said, plunging my hand into the mound. The mound took the bag from my hand, almost up to my elbow in sewage. I dug until the water level sank. I owe you one, dog, my cellmate said. It's your turn next time, I said. Because the tap water hadn't come back on, I couldn't wash my arm. Not wanting to contaminate anything in the cell, I sat on the stool until the guard let us out for showers hours later. Now, once you're sentenced, you go to the penitentiary, the state prison system, and they take the black and white stripes off you and put you in an orange jumpsuit. I started out in super maximum security. The most violent, dangerous prisoners in the entire system are in there, including Arizona's death row. You very rarely get out of your cell. Armed guards in shank-proof body armor come and feed you through a trap in the door. My first cellmate in Supermax is a Satanist. He's got a pentagram tattooed on his forehead in for murder, part of a cult that was drinking blood and eating human body parts. He was actually very nice to me though, fortunately. I didn't have any problems with him whatsoever. I got moved to medium security. I think these guys will be big softies after Supermax. I was wrong. My first cellmate is this guy on the left. He's a serial home invader torturer. He was breaking into people's houses and his preferred method of torture was to take a hammer to their kneecaps. He tells me the night I move in, I've got a padlock in a sock. I can smash your brains in while you sleep. I can kill you whenever I want. Really nice guy. Now he was very sneaky. The two things you look forward to the most in, in prison are your visits and your mail. And he knew my mum and dad were flying 5,000 miles to come and see me for Christmas. So we got his mate, this 20 stone California biker on the right, to attack me just as I'm going to this, first, this visit with my parents. I have no, no idea this has been planned. I'm just going to the visit happy as can be. The big guy comes up behind me, starts kidney punching me. All the prisoners stop to see my reaction because the gang rule is you must hit back or else you're considered a punk and everyone preys on you. But if you do hit back and the guards see it, you're arrested and sent to a prison within the prison called lockdown or the hole and you lose all your privileges, including your visits. So I had to think really quickly because I didn't want to lose a visit with my parents coming all that way. So I spun around, tried throwing some kicks and punches. It was no good. It was like hitting a big bag of cement. And he was a kickboxer. He spun me around, smashed my back up real good, and he ended up going to the visit all injured. My mum's asking me what's wrong with me. And I can't say, because my mum, you know, my mum's already a nervous breakdown of the situation. I didn't want to worry her any more than, than was necessary. When I get back from the visit, the big guy's got a young person dangling by the neck from a second story balcony. My cellmate, he's getting higher on heroin and crystal meth and acting crazier and crazier towards me. He's keeping me awake all night, interrogating me, 
and he's even showing me the padlock in the sock that he's going to smash my head in with. It was the only time in the whole of my incarceration that I asked for some outside help. I called my family and said, look, can you put a call into the British Embassy and see if they'll call the prison and get me moved out of this cell, because I think this guy's going to try and kill me. I can't sleep around him or anything. But when the, if the embassy call the prison, they can't say anything that will get him in trouble from what I've said, because if he gets in trouble, then that would make me a snitch, and everyone's going to want to kill me. Fortunately, the embassy handled it appropriately, and he was moved without me getting into any trouble. He's throwing batteries at me for a couple of weeks afterwards, until I got a cellmate who was bigger than him, who had some words, and then it all stopped after that. Now, because my blog was getting in the news, some of the more extreme characters were asking me to put their stories on the internet. T-Bone, six and a half foot, former Marine, trained to kill, seen action in South America. Have any of you guys seen that movie, The Green Mile? They call, the prisoners call him John Coffey after that, that character in that movie. That's how big he is. Yeah, when T-Bone came to my cell window door to introduce himself, he completely blocked the sunlight out. I was just writing at my little stool. I turn around, there he is. He's just got his pants on, covered in scars, massive scars. Looks like someone has cut him up and sewn him back together again. Every single scar was a different life and death prison fight story. He was the ultimate prison gladiator. But not only was he standing up for himself, he was stopping the raping of the young people. He said that was the foulest thing anyone could do to anyone. And he wasn't just going in and knocking the rapists out. It wasn't that easy. He was getting stabbed, hit in the head with river rocks in socks. All life and death stuff, and he's got the scars to prove it. And he was doing this for no reward whatsoever, just making enemies left and right. No one would have even known about it if I hadn't come along. So obviously the guy's got a big heart. From telling his story across the UK, it was students in Liverpool suggested we start a page for him on Facebook called the T-Bone Appreciation Society. There's about 5,000 students on it now. He doesn't have internet access. I print out his Facebook wall and mail it to him in America. And he said the highlight of his day is reading all these questions and these comments from these UK students. And when he gets out, he's hoping to look into getting his passport and coming out and, and doing talks to schools as well. So if you're on Facebook and you've got a minute to, to give him a like or put some on his wall, it's all appreciated. All right, Frankie, Mexican Mafia hitman. He was in for murder for hire. He beat that case because all the witnesses disappeared. But over the years, he ended up serving 29 years of his life behind bars. He's only served 13 years of his life outside of institutions and prisons. Frankie's a bit like that character in Goodfellas, played by the actor Joe Pesky, the little gangster. One minute he's cracking jokes, the next minute deadly serious shooting the way to that kind of character. The first time Frankie came to my cell window, my pants and boxers were down, and I was applying antifungal ointment to the bleeding bed sores on my buttocks. He took one look at this through the window, disappeared, and decided to play a practical joke on me. A couple of hours later, I got a mysterious love letter shoved under my door, commenting on my hurry arse, <laughs> and proposing we have a gay prison marriage. His exact words were, I'm looking forward to shampooing your hurry arse on our honeymoon in San Francisco. <laughs> Fortunately, that was just his sense of humor. He was a chess heavyweight, and I started to play chess with him on a regular basis, and there was no kinky sex stuff involved. Xena, six and a half foot charismatic transsexual. That's a man who thinks he's a woman. Xena wakes up one morning, drinks a cup of coffee, grabs a razor blade, and starts to cut his man parts off. He gets the right side off, and the left side hides, 
and he's got his hand up in his guts looking for it and where he's got it tied off to stop the blood comes undone all his blood starts coming out he passes out in a pool of blood on the cell floor and they get a helicopter to the prison just in time to get him to hospital to save his life now I'm bringing Zena into it because we're getting to the most graphic part of the whole talk the subject is prison gang rape again why am I getting into these gruesome things because the drugs lifestyle is so glamorized but they don't show what happens to the young people when they get busted the old cons are checking them out when they walk through the door they call them the fresh fish they're pre-selecting who they're gonna rape this doesn't just happen in prisons in America, it happens in all over the world. It happens in the female side as well. In Arizona, the females shoved socks inside of socks until it became a hard object, and that's what they used. Now, when Zena came in, it was tw over 20 years ago, he didn't look like this. He was a young person, he was weightlifting, bigger than, much bigger than this, and he clicked up with the gang as a debt collector and it's blood in, blood out, and he crossed the gang, and I'm going to read an actual conversation of what happened to Zena. The first time was a gang rape. That he beat me up, stuffed things inside my body, beat me until I was unconscious, raped me while I was unconscious. What did they stick inside your body? A broomstick. How do you know if you were unconscious that they raped you? When I had to go to the toilet afterwards, I could tell by what came out. What did you do after being raped? I sat in my cell for two weeks, waiting for the scars to go. I got moved, but the same thing happened. They beat me up, raped me, used me afterwards as a sex toy, a prostitute, a punk. How come no one would help you? You can't snitch and the guards won't even believe you. Did you think about killing the people who did this to you? I thought about killing myself first. I wanted to, I still do sometimes. At this point, Zena started crying and he couldn't answer any more questions. But he came back later in the day with more information and I said to him, have you got any advice for parents whose youngsters are in prison for lesser charges? Marijuana, drunk driving, does this mostly happen to youngsters? Yes, it does, but it can happen to anyone. I've seen it happen to big dudes, skinny, even the ugliest people in the world. People who come to prison who aren't street smart and don't understand the mentality of ghetto life, they get preyed on the most. How did you stop it? I took the abuse for as long as I could and I started fighting. I won most of the fights. When I stood up and told them I didn't care about getting killed, it stopped. You've got to be ruthless. You've got to be ruthless. That's understatement. Zena hadn't told me the truth as to how he'd stopped the gang raping business because he didn't want to risk getting any trouble for what he'd done. Zena was studying anatomy, the human body, and he came up with an idea. The next two times the gang came to rape Zena, the first member of the gang to put his hand on Zena. Zena plucked his eyeball out, eyeball dangling out on the optic nerve, and Zena saying, I don't care if I live or die. That's what it took. Now, there's usually someone worse off than you in the prison system. And at the same time, Zena had a friend who was gang raped. Then they held him down. They took a light bulb, shoved it in his backside, and smashed it while it was in there. He had another friend who was gang raped and decapitated. They held him down, cut his head off with a shovel, which is not an easy thing to do and takes some time. When the head was finally off, they took it and they put it in an area of the prison where the rival gangs would see it to make the point that they were the most violent and ruthless out of all of the gangs. 
These guys looked at me as a visitor to their world with my little sentence. They were all serving decades, and the stories they told me just blew my mind. That's why to this day, I put the stories, I continue to put the stories on the internet. Now, I've not come here today to whine about getting caught selling ecstasy and ending up in this environment. I take full responsibility my actions choosing to break all these drug laws lead into this. When I first started doing drugs, I was a little bit older than you guys, I'd seen the celebrity addicts, I'd seen the movies, I'd seen the music videos. I thought it was the funnest, coolest thing in the world. That's how it starts out, and that's why so many people get sucked in. But over time, you've got to do more drugs to keep the high going, or you step up to harder drugs, and it ends in a possible range of bad things. Drugs started as fun for my head bouncer, Cody Bates. He lost his mind in his late 20s. His parents sent him to rehab and he hung himself. I married one of the most glamorous women in the raves out there. Drugs started out as fun for her too. She lost her mind. She wants to die in Egypt. She wants to get bitten by a snake and die like Cleopatra. She got a one-way ticket to Egypt. She couldn't get a snake, so in a hotel room, she made a weapon out of a Mark III razor, took a bunch of prescription pills, and slashed her wrists. Drugs started as fun for another one of my bouncers, Big Micah. He never got busted with us, and he continued. And his girlfriend sent me an email saying, Big Micah's in hospital. He needs a new heart because of his drug taking, or else he's going to die. And he's only in his 30s. So you never know what's going to come at you next. There's a reason you don't see many old drug users out there. They're either dead or they're in prison. And what happened to Whitney Houston last year is a perfect example. Now, I served just under six years and I'm banned for life from America. My first year back in England, I'm in Widnes, on the dole, living with my mum and dad. I can't get a job because it comes up, I've got a criminal record for ecstasy dealing and my story's all over the internet. You know, if you get busted smoking pot, drunk driving, you get a criminal record and it pops right up at the job interview process. And it's hard enough to get a job as it is in this economic environment. You've also got to think about the effects of choosing the drugs lifestyle on your loved ones. You know, I wasn't thinking about my mum and dad getting my party friends high. They're 5,000 miles away, they'll never find out. Well, two months after my arrest, I'm the cover story of this newspaper out of Phoenix. English Sean's Evil Empire. It's 10 pages long. Everything I did and 10 times more are in this article. They portray me to be a cross between Tony Soprano and a vampire. So I called my aunt in Phoenix after reading it. I said, don't let my mum and dad see this, you know? They're just gentle, loving people. It's gonna break their hearts. She said, Sean, it's too late. There's an internet version. Now my mum read it and she had a nervous breakdown. She was a college teacher at the time and she went into the college after reading it. And there was a group of foreign students and she ran up to them saying, they all know, they all know, you know, they've read the article, they've read the article. They didn't have a clue what she was on about. My dad had to go to college and pick her up and she'd been on enough medication to this day. You know, I live near London now. So to come and do this talk, you know, I stayed at my parents' house for the last couple of nights. I can still see the hurt and pain on their faces that I've caused them over the years. People say to me all the time, Sean, you live this wild and crazy life. Is there anything about it you would change? And automatically what I want to change is, I want to take that hurt and pain off their faces, but I can't, and it makes me sick to my stomach. And it's something that I've got to live with for the rest of my life. My party friends owed me hundreds of thousands of dollars. I barely saw a penny of that back. My parents remortgaged their house, cashed in their retirement accounts, and I come up with almost $100,000 to get me out of that situation. You know, I still owe them most of that money. I'm just slowly paying it back. So you've really got to think about the effects um, on your family. Now, an important thing I learned about myself is 
from the prison psychotherapist, Dr. O. I've got this risk-taking, thrill-seeking, adrenaline junkie personality type. That's why I was attracted to the ups and downs of the stock market. And it was also what attracted me to things that lead to trouble. He said, the key to deal with this is to view it as just energy. I was choosing to take my energy and put it into all these negative addictions. Racing around 120 miles an hour in my sports car, high on crystal meth. Hanging out with all these gangsters in the drug community. All this stuff that could have got me killed. I still hear the wolves howling for me to come out and party. You know, back then, all week long, I could hear the wolves and I couldn't stay in on by the weekend. I just had to go out and party. Even now, when I hear an old school rave tune, it sends that jolt, jolt of excitement, excitement right up my spine. You know, and you get all that goose flesh feeling. It just takes you right back down. But I remember what Dr. O said. It's all energy. I'll take that energy now, go to the fitness center, do karate, come out on natural high. I'll jump around with 60 sweaty women at one of these body combat classes, the thumping dance music. It's like a rave in there about the drugs. And you come out on natural high. Now you all look like model students. So did I back then. If any of you have got this thrill-seeking, risk-taking side to you, you just got to ask yourselves, you know, out of all your interests, what are the positive ones you could go and channel that energy into that won't get you in trouble? Extreme example. Say you're the kind of person likes walking up to strangers, smacking them in the face and getting into fights. How could you possibly turn that around? Take that energy, put it to martial arts, boxing. At the end of the day, get awarded prizes for it instead of getting a criminal record that's going to go on to damage your future career prospects. Now, before we go to questions, I'm just going to read some advice given to me by the mighty T-Bone. Let's get him back up here. <clears throat> the prisoners, when they're getting released, their mates give them advice about staying off the drugs. And the guy who's getting released, what he'll say is, I'm going to stay off the drugs. I'm going to send you some money to spend on commissary. I'm going to send you some books to read. And you never hear from them again until six months later when they're rearrested for drugs. Unfortunately, the cycle of addiction is too hard for most of them to break when they're that deep into it. And the American prisons give them no education or rehabilitation because they want them to come right back. It's $50,000 a year of taxpayers' money per prisoner. It's just a business model. So as you can imagine, your mates try and shake some sense into you when you're at the gate. And here's what T-Bone said to me. Check this out, Sean. When I was running around in my coke days, I ran into all kinds of people who did all kinds of things. And some of the drug money they made went places to hurt people. Do you hear me, brother? No matter how cool it may seem, drugs will lead to the police prison or death. That's real, man. You need to keep yourself away from anyone associated with it because it's wrong and dangerous. Once you allow yourself to become addicted to pot, coke, heroin, or any pill, it may start out as fun, but it will eventually ruin your life. That is my story. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you. All right, if anyone's got any questions, I just need you to put your hand up. I know you might be stunned by the contents of the talk right now. And I definitely know on your mind is, how does a business graduate from Witness who came from your school survive an environment like this? You know, because I'm not a tough guy, so that's got to be on your mind. Now, out of the over 100 people who arrested with me, were some of my bouncers from the rave scene, including my best mate from Witness, who I grew up with, massive fellow called Wildman, twice my size. So I had those guys in there with me when I was first starting out. And we were all looking out for each other. We were one of the biggest groups in the jail because there was over a hundred of us you know, over the course of all the arrests. So it was more of a case of me seeing the violence in the jail than experiencing it. 
you know, but I did see some pretty horrific things. I had to get used to the sounds of heads getting bashed against toilets, bodies getting thrown around, hitting the wall, people getting carried out on stretchers who looked like they were dead, yellow brain fluid leaking from their heads, stuff like that. Later on, when I was sentenced and separated from all of my co-defendants, the guys I was writing about at my blog, they started to get letters and books sent to them from all over the world. And they thought that was the coolest thing because they were never going to communicate with anyone outside of the prison walls again. So a community formed around John's Jail Journal, around my blog, and we all looked out for each other. And one of the guys whose stories I was putting on the internet, and he was also dictating to me his life story, was Two Tonys. He was a mafia mass murderer who left dead bodies from Tucson to Alaska. He claimed they all had it coming because they were rival gangsters. So he didn't see anything wrong with that. He was serving 112 years. If you're murdering gangsters, you're at the top of the respect order on the prison yard. There's a hierarchy amongst the murderers. If you're a murderer of a woman or a kid, you're at the very bottom. The other prisoners try and kill those guys as soon as they come in. I did have problems with the gang members, but two Tonys made them go away. Because if I got smashed, then I get moved and I can no longer continue to write his stories. And T-Bone and all of my other pr prison friends stood up for me as well during those situations. Do you guys know how they get the drugs in? Did, did someone whisper bum? <laughs> okay, what they do is people bring them to medium security or minimum security visit where you sat with the prisoner. They'll, they'll wrap the drugs in condoms, cellophane, balloons, and they'll have them on their body. Or they'll bring a baby, and the drugs will be in the baby's nappy. Prisoners distract the visitation officers. While they're distracted, the drugs are passed under the table, and the prisoner shoves them in his behind. The guys who specialize in this are called mules. They get paid a percentage of what they bring in. Now you're strip searched all the time in prison. As soon as you go in, close off, get completely naked in front of the guard. You strip search after every single visit. So if you're a man, the guard stood about here. You're here completely naked. You erase your man parts, turn around, bend over, spread your buttocks wide open and cough. And the guards are looking right up your backside to see if you're smuggling anything in. Those mules pride themselves on how many packages they can store up there without them peeking out during these strip searches. And you hear them, you see them walking back from visitation, all bandy-legged. You think they get busted on that, on that walk alone, but they don't, you know. There's also a foreskin search for drugs. But I will leave the details of that to your imaginations, as it's almost lunchtime. <laughs> Has anyone got anything? We've got a couple of minutes left. Okay, right here. Did you see a future for yourself? Were you in no, actually, you know, I was, did I see a future for myself, he asked. Um, when they told me I was facing up to 200 years, I didn't see any future for myself at all. And I know it sounds self-pitying, and my thing is I take full responsibility for putting myself in here. But at that point, I did just want to slash my wrists and end my life. The thing that would give me the strength not to do it was, I'd look at the photos of my mom and dad and sister and girlfriend, and I'd think, you know, my mum's gonna get a call from an ad saying her son's slashed his wrist in an Arizona jail cell, and that would give me the strength not to do it. I couldn't bear the thought of putting my family through that. Now, over time, as my writing progressed and developed, you know, I'm on a mission to expose what's been going on in this jail. And that's now developed into me becoming a published author. So that's my profession now. I never set out to be a writer. I only started writing because that guard said to me, the world's got no idea what's going in the jail. My sister's got a degree in classical literature, speaks five languages, always wants to be an author. I never even read a single book of fiction before I got arrested. All I read was um, finance books. The last book I'd read before my arrest was in this school when it was To Kill a Mockingbird, which was required reading in the English classes. Yeah. Now, you know, my mission was to get that jail exposed to the world. And just last Wednesday, 
My story was broadcast on national TV in America to almost 10 million viewers as an episode of Locked Up Abroad, Raving Arizona. I woke up the next day with 500 emails. Yeah. People just outraged at the conditions, outraged at the sheriff. You know, prison shouldn't be easy, but guards murdering mental Ill, mentally ill inmates routinely, dead rats in the food, cockroaches all over, you know, all that is illegal. The sheriff's purporting to uphold the law while those conditions are in violation of all these human rights. The episode now is going to be broadcast to 36 countries worldwide to over 50 million viewers. So people are going to finally know what's going on in this jail, you know, and I'm hoping that that's going to put pressure on Arizona to get those conditions improved. I've even had emails from people who supported the sheriff and they've said after watching the episode they're no longer supporting him. Since then it's, it's, been, it's gone to over a thousand emails and messages since Wednesday and I've only had four death threats and hate emails which I think is pretty good from um, followers of the sheriff only had four, which is pretty good. So yeah, so in answer to your question, I didn't, you know, I, I, was, it was, I, I was on the abyss of madness in there. Didn't really see what my future held. But it has sent my life in this whole new positive direction I didn't expect. I had no idea I, I would come in and end up talking to schools and stuff like that. Um, I got released to London and I did a BBC interview. A Harley Street drug counsellor, Tony McClellan, heard it and he contacted the BBC and he said, I'd like Sean to go into schools and tell his story. I said, oh, well, I've, I've got to readjust to society first. You know, it sounds like a good opportunity, but I've got to readjust. It took me a year to get the nerve up. It was Bishop Stortford College, year 11, I think. So scared I couldn't even eat my breakfast. I went into that hall and I couldn't even look at the audience. I was more scared of this year 11 than I was these murderers and gangsters I've been living with. For the entire hour, I paced from side to side for the entire hour. I think Pauline remembers my pacing days um, from back here at this school as well, because it was one of the first schools I, I spoke at. And I got out of that talk, and I called my mum, and I said, they must have thought I was a lunatic. I'm not cut out for public speaking at all. And I, you know, I'm getting depressed then. I've got a criminal record, can't get a job. And a couple of weeks later, I got an email from the school, and they said, we get a professional public speaker in, Every week, our kids voted you the best talk of the year, and we would very much like for you to come back. And that got my confidence up. And since then, I've been doing over 100 talks a year to schools. I've damaged my larynx from doing so many talks. I've been in and out of hospital with it. I've had to slow it down a bit. This episode today is getting filmed, and it's going to go on YouTube, and any school in the world is going to be able to watch it and benefit from it for free. But what keeps me going is all the responses from you guys. I get all these comments and tweets and emails and I get to see it through you guys' eyes. You know, stuff like we don't listen to our teachers, we don't listen to our parents. But because your story's true, you know, you've shown us what this can lead to. So it's make, making people, you know, think, really think long and hard about what, what the horrors of what drugs can lead to. So it keeps me motivated. And it's making me, making me proud as well in my mum's eyes as well, because she sees a lot of these messages as well, restoring me. And I feel this is a better way for me to be repaying my debt to society than the actual prison sentence. So. Did you want to say anything, Mum? Did you have anything to add? talk is very important because he was one of you he was a student just like you and he had a wonderful future ahead of him he had all these ambitions and drugs basically getting involved in drugs just devastated his life and it devastated our lives as Sean said I had a nervous breakdown and I've been on and off medication because it was very difficult to deal with having a child in prison um, we were typing up the blogs and I, could, I, I was reading all the horrific things that were happening to him. And it was just a terrible time. But although I was very 
sad and ashamed and upset of what Sean did because he did wrong. There's no way, you know, he did wrong. As he says himself, he takes responsibility for it. If you get involved in drugs, you have to be prepared for the consequences. No, it's your choice. It's your, you have these choices in life. But since he's come out of prison, I am so proud Thank you. of how he has um, rehabilitated, it, <coughs> rehabilitated himself, how he's become um, a published author with nearly three books yep. under his belt. And, but most importantly, important is the fact that he talks to children in schools, to, to teenagers in schools. And if he can save one of you from going down that path, well, all our suffering has been worth it. Oh, well, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thanks, thanks. Thank you.